Hey, Wayne Fox back with another quick video. This one is about Lightroom Classic 9.0, which Adobe released the other day. As typical, most of these releases don't have a lot of new content because instead of a great big release every 18 months to two years, we're getting things trickling out all the time. If you look at everything that Adobe added in the last 12 months or so, there's a lot of stuff in Lightroom that we didn't have 12 months ago. This particular release has two or three really nice new features that I think a lot of people are gonna find useful, unlike the last one, which I think was pretty limited. So the one thing I will mention is that uh, I watched a lot of the other videos on this online and there's one feature, or I don't know if you call it a feature, but there's one thing that's changed, which is pretty significant and it'll kind of get you if you're not careful. I've already had it kind of get me on a couple of old files and I haven't seen anybody mention it at all. It's something I kind of stumbled across and then I tested it. So that's toward the end of the video. You might want to make sure you hang around till you watch that one. So anyway, let's get in to see what's new about 9.0 and see why it's a 9.0 instead of 8.5. So I believe the reason this is a full numbered release is it because it does require a new database structure for your catalog. I'm gonna open this older catalog here. It'll open in the new version of Classic. It will tell me I need to upgrade the catalog and it will also uh, move the previews. Now, it'll tell you you can't do it if you need backwards compatibility. Please back this catalog up. Well, the fact is it actually does back up the catalog already. If I hit upgrade, it will make a new catalog and leave the old one in place. It doesn't actually update the old catalog. Let's get that, let that finish real quick. And here we go. And if I go back to the finder, you'll see that what it did was it created and it gave it two. Here's my original catalog that I had. And then all of the other ones, it uh, added the dash two to it. But if I want to open this old catalog back up, I just need to install the previous version of Lightroom, which is pretty easy to do. I just go up to my Adobe Cloud uh, application. I go to the Lightroom Classic, click the little uh, three dots here. I can't remember the fancy word for that, ellipse, lisps, or something like that. Go to other versions, and I can scroll back, back to Lightroom 8.2.1, which is, I don't know, a year, year and a half, a year ago or so. So anyway, that's why I believe it's a full number version is because it requires a new catalog structure. And it could be that just once a year they've decided to change it. So each year it's a new number. Uh, it's funny because I think they call this Lightroom 2019 and I think Photoshop they're calling 2020. Haven't quite figured that one out yet. But they also give it a version number. So you can see Photoshop version 21 now. And Lightroom Classic is, is uh, version 9. So I'm gonna start with what I feel is the best new feature and I think something that photographers have been waiting for for a long time. That's the ability to export multiple files at the same time. If I go here, you'll notice that all of the uh, export uh, templates have a checkbox and I can say I wanna export my Facebook size image. I wanna export one that goes to my website and I need to export a uh, full size JPEG. I can do that to all three one thing to be aware of is that you can't make changes to your format once you've selected multiple ones. So you need to turn the check boxes off, make sure that all of your settings are set up. Once you've got them set up in each of the ones you want to use, turn them on. And what's cool is you'll notice that I have this set to choose folder later in all three of these. And as soon as I say export, it's going to allow me to go choose which folder I want each of these three different outputs to go to. So I can go here and I can say, put those here and I can go here and I can say put those somewhere else. Now sometimes in my case I use predetermined folders like all the website ones go to a specific place and of course if you've got the folder set to be a specific location that's definitely honored. But it's going to make all of these three different versions of the files for me and it's going to put them in the correct place. Uh, very cool. I think this is a feature that a lot of photographers have been wanting for a long time uh, and I think it's going to be really useful. So the feature that's getting the most talk about, and it's pretty cool. Unfortunately, I don't have any uh, samples that'll show how good it is, but uh, I can demonstrate it. And that's the ability to use content aware fill to fill in the blank spots when creating a panorama. So this uh, group of pictures is a panorama that I shot. I'm gonna go ahead and merge this into a panorama. And of course, you'll notice that there's some blank spots. Now, I've you, uh, we've had boundary warp for a while. And to me, boundary warp actually works pretty good because I think that these edges, the reason they're this way is because they've been warped in the process of trying to make everything fit together. And I think it actually 
uh, and I've never tested it, but I actually think it makes things correct. However, if you don't like boundary warp, the other option now that they've added is this fill edges button. And if I do this, it will use content aware fill and it will fill all the blank spots in at the edges. And if you'll notice, if I turn this off and on, just watch this section down here where the grass is, it's actually doing a pretty good job. Now, like I said, I don't have anything that shows anything real dramatic. I do suggest that maybe you pop over and watch uh, Matt Kloskowski's video on this because he actually shows a really good example of creating, it creates leaves and limbs and stuff. And uh, he said he was able to fix what it missed in Photoshop within a few minutes. So it really is a cool feature. And I think this is something that is uh, in some cases you get some pretty big blank spots and this might really help. So uh, nice new feature. So in the last version, they gave us the ability to put a color label to our collections. It helps us organize those. Uh, and of course, we've been able to do that in folders for, I don't know, a couple versions now. Um, let's just take a quick look here. So you can see I've got a few of them in here. What they've added, which makes these even more useful now, is the ability to search. You know, we could search in the last version if there was a color label or not, but now we can search by color label. So you could create color labels and you could organize your collections for different purposes. And you can say, okay, I just want to see my purple uh, collections. And then I, I want to see my red, color. I don't know which colors I have in here, blue. And so you might have each of the colors might represent a different type of collection. And that lets you sort those um, out. You can also say, I want to see uh, ones that have no color labels at all. And of course, they've added the same thing to folders. You can now go and search folders and you can search by color label. So you can say, show me all of my folders that have the color purple. This I think can be very useful because you could do a lot of organizational things. As I mentioned in the last video, one thing you can do also is you can go to metadata color label sets and you can give your folder color label sets and your collection color label sets their own custom name. So instead of just a color like this, you know, red, you can say what the color means. So you can actually help use the color labels to kind of uh, organize your workflow. So I think that's a helpful feature. I don't know how much I'll use it, but I know those that shoot a lot might find some real use for that. To get out of this view, you go here, notice their choice. Any means any color label at all means none means there are no labels. But if you just go back to all, then that eliminates the search function. And now you're back to your normal view. A couple of small changes in interface into the develop module. They've added the ability to eliminate steps above a certain point. So let's say that you did some things. You were trying to mess around with this file, see if you liked it. And you, then you say, oh, I really messed that up. And you want to go back. One challenge is if you come back to this file later, you don't remember that you were those were experimental. Well, now you can right click here and you can clear that history. Somewhat useful sometimes. The other thing they've added in the modules is the ability to export presets and templates. So if you go to user presets and you want to export any of these, you just right click on them and you can export those. And if they're in a group, uh, you, like here, you can actually export the whole group. Notice you can also import a group of templates as well. So if you buy a, a, some templates from somebody else, it's a lot easier to import them. You just go to here and hit the import button. If I pop over to the print module, you'll see that the same thing applies here. If I go to, uh, you know, if I have a layout that I really like uh, and I want to give it to somebody else, I can actually go and uh, right click on the layout and I can export it. Or if somebody has a layout they put some effort into and it's real useful, I can import that in as well. I would assume this works for things like slideshows and other things like that. So anything that we had to use the preset manager for now, you can use directly in the interface. One thing, if you have GPU acceleration on your computer and you go to the crop tool and it has a vignette applied to it. So let's put a really dark vignette. You'll notice that before when you went to the crop tool, that vignette didn't disappeared. And now you'll see a preview of the vignette as you create your crop. Before this would eliminate the vignette while you were cropping and you wouldn't be able to really tell what it was doing until you actually did the crop. They've added the ability to find images that have a depth map. You just go to your search library filter and under metadata, you can select um, depth as one of the criteria. 
In this case, I don't have any. I've got uh, three that are unknown and this many that don't. So, so I don't actually can't find any of those. But uh, there are some cameras that create depth maps, and I don't know if mostly are phones or whatever, but that's something they've added. So in the past, if you wanted to delete multiple pictures, you had to be in the grid view. But now if you have a, the loop view up and you're looking at a photograph and you've got a set and in the bottom, you can actually select those. And if you hold the shift key down and hit delete or backspace, will allow you to delete those as well. And it gives you the same options as before. You can either delete them from your disk completely or you just can remove them from the Lightroom library. So the final thing I wanted to mention is uh, something that I think has slipped by most people. None of the videos I watch, and I watch quite a few, mention this at all. I kind of stumbled across this in the documentation. In the past, when Adobe's introduced a new process version, they've always allowed you to work in the old process version, and you could update the image if you wanted to. And if you'll notice this image, if I go up here in the little lightning bolt and I hover over it, uh, it tells me that I'm in process version 3. And I can also go down to my calibration panel and it shows me I'm in process version three. Now, if I make any change in the develop module, you'll notice that those immediately change and now it automatically switches to process version five. You can no longer work in process versions three or four. I don't believe you can in one or two either. I can't test those. And while that might not be a problem, I think sometimes it can snag you because I have had times in the past where I changed from an old process version to a new one and there's a fairly obvious difference in what it does to the file. The one thing you can do if you want to be safe, let's go back and let's get rid of that, is you can click the little lightning bolt and you can tell it, so you can make the change to process five before you actually work on the file anymore. And this lets you review the changes with a before and after. So I can see, I don't know if you can see this or not, but this is a little more saturated. There's a little bit more blue in this area here. These are not exactly the same. There's some differences down here visually. I don't know if you can see them on the TV. They are pretty subtle, but if I wanna make this file look like this one, I've gotta make some changes. Now, once I've made these changes, the before stays the same and I can make changes here so I can work on this file and I can try to get my new one to look like my old one if there's any differences before I accept it. And once I do that, then now the before is gone, of course. So if you're working on an old file that's in process three or four, I would suggest that you click the little lightning bolt first and just double check it to make sure it's not gonna mess your colors up. I think most of the time will be insignificant, but if you're a high level color person and you see the subtle differences, uh, you might want to check it out before you let uh, Lightroom just automatically move you to process five. I think it does this because process five is the only process that can actually leverage the GPU to speed things up. And I do think it does a better job. Used to be when I went from four to five or three to four, most of my files showed a pretty obvious difference and I've tested quite a few and now it's all very, very, very subtle. So I think they did a better job of making sure the conversion matches visually what uh, you're expecting. Well, I think that's about enough. I tend to get long-winded. Hopefully uh, it wasn't too boring. Uh, if you have any questions about anything that I presented, don't be afraid to drop a comment down below. If you kind of like what I do, I'm getting more and more of these videos out. Make sure you subscribe to my channel down there and uh, always appreciate anybody that hits that like button. I don't get a lot of likes. I think most people don't bother with that anymore. Anyway, I've got some new stuff coming out in another week or two. I can't wait to get those done. And until next time, hey, see ya.